Good morning. So there was a magician who had a parrot. And every time he'd do his act, the parrot would say, Oh, it's in his pocket. Or, Oh, it's up his sleeve. Well, anyways, the magician got called on to go onto this cruise ship and do his act. And sure enough, he did, he did a little trick with a coin and the crowd was like, ah, and the parrot goes, it's up his sleeve. He did, it, he did another one, it's in his pocket. And then all of a sudden the boat blew up and they're floating for three days and the magician and the parrot says nothing for three days. And then all of a sudden the parrot says, all right, you got me, where's the boat? All right, it has nothing to do with our message this morning, but anyways. So we've been in the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews was written to the Hebrews. That's pretty profound, isn't it? To the Jews trying to show them that Jesus is the what? The Messiah, the great Messiah, right? In fact, we've looked at, as we've gone through the chapters, you know, that Jesus is greater than uh, what were some of the uh, people or... Pe What's that? Angels, Moses, Abraham. The first one was the prophets. Jesus is greater than. We also talked about um, Abraham, Moses, and last week was Joshua, right? Greater than Joshua. So this, the next couple weeks, he's, in fact, all the way through the book, and we've met, hinted on it before, but we're going to continue to um, but this week is like Jesus as the great high priest. Jesus as the great high priest. We're just going to look at a couple of verses this morning, um, finishing up the chapter 4, and it's 14 through 16. And it says this Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray as we go through your word this morning that we will understand you just a little better and how much and how great you are, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So do you see they use that word, right? Great. Since we have a great high priest. When you think of great, it goes a little bit better than a little better than normal, right? It's not like he's a mediocre high priest. He's not like he's a normal high priest. It's not like he's, you know, he's a little better than the average high priest. They've got to get you at this idea that he is the great high priest. In other words, there's no one greater. There's no one that could even come close. He is above and beyond in so many ways. And then he's going to give us a few reasons here. So our question this morning is, what makes Jesus great? What makes Jesus great, uh, more specifically, as a high priest this morning? We've been seeing this word, therefore, a lot in Hebrews, haven't we? We see it twice in just these couple verses. Last week we saw it twice in the passage we were in. And over and over again, like since the first chapter, it's, it says something and it says therefore. And therefore means what? You need to find out what it's there for. Therefore always refers back to what he's just been talking about, right? And so one thing that we're seeing, because the word therefore is there so much, that he's showing that this all kind of, he's leading up to something, right? It's all continuous, you could say. It's not like there's one chunk here and one chunk here. You got to remember that when you come to the Word of God. You need to. It helps you understand it better. That when you read a book of the Bible, it wasn't written in chapters and verses or chunks. It was written as one volume. So Hebrews was written in one book and... So it, it makes a difference, right, how you look at it. And so, so, by the way, chapter titles or chapter... Yeah, titles aren't inspired either, but chapter breakdowns are not inspired, and sometimes they're in exactly the wrong place, and they're breaking up a thought that the author intended. 
but that's just a little aside for you. But what makes Jesus great? We're just going to look at a few things right here in this passage. Therefore, because we just talked about in last week that nothing is hidden from God, right? If you look at chapter 12, it says that the word of God is piercing, dividing. In other words, it gets to what really is going on in our heart. We talked about the theme for camp this, this year has been the issues of the heart. And the passage we just looked at last week was how the word of God, whether it's the written word or the living word, Jesus himself, totally sees what's going on inside us. We don't hide anything from God. Did you know that? That can be looked at two different ways, can it? You know, that God knows us wherever we're at, and that can be comforting, can it? But that God knows us wherever we're at can be discomforting too, can it? <laughs> Depending on where we are and where we're located and what we're doing and what's going on, what we're thinking, all those things. We're, are we actually doing good right now or are we sinning? But the, but the verses we, uh, verse 13 that we just finished with last week, it says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we have to do, or we said to whom we will give a reckoning. And then it comes to, therefore, because of that, we have a great high priest. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So let us hold fast to our confession. Number one, I, I got four points here just from this about four things that shows us and what makes Jesus great. The number one is this. He says, Jesus, the Son of God. Number one thing that makes Jesus great, <laughs> that nobody else has, Jesus was both God and man. Does that make Jesus great? It makes him great even as a high priest, right? So it makes him great. Jesus, Jehovah saves is what it means. That was his earthly name, right? They didn't know that name in the Old Testament. He was known as Messiah. He was known as the anointed one, which is also the word Christ, but he was never known as Jesus. Jesus... Jehovah saves was the word given to him, the name given to him um, when they were told to name him, uh, told Joseph and Mary to name him that. First Timothy 2.5 kind of goes along with that, has that idea of him as, as our human but great high priest, and it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There is only one person who can mediate between us and God. There's only one man that can do it, and that is Jesus Christ. He's the only, but he is the one who can. So what does it mean to mediate? Anybody here ever been in, well, I shouldn't ask you, you don't want to answer, right? Have you ever been in mediation? Yeah, <laughs> there's quite a few in this audience, whether you raise your hand or not, I know you have been. Mediation means somebody comes alongside to speak for you, Right? They're kind of, they're representing you. They're trying to help you out to maybe get you out of trouble. We also call it diversion today, right? And many of us have been in that. I, I guess I haven't been in that one yet, but I've been in some of those situations. Jesus is the only one who can mediate perfectly for us with God the Father. In fact, in um, 1 John 2, 1, it calls him our advocate, in fact, there's another word for lawyer. He's the one who represents our case before the Father. And we've talked about this before, that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. He's the one saying, hey, look at what... And when you're a Christian, you're, you're part of the brethren, and Satan is trying to make you look bad, which he has plenty of ammunition, doesn't he? In all of us, to make us look bad before God the Father. But Jesus is our mediator that says to God the Father... He's one of mine. My blood has paid for his sin. He has been washed in the blood. He's one of mine. He's our mediator. The idea of mediating also is, it, is prayer. In John 17, Jesus is praying for us. And if you know Christ as your Savior, do you know John, Jesus is praying for you? That's part of being a mediator. I don't know how all that works. It seems uh, it's beyond my comprehension. But he is our mediator the man, Christ Jesus. He's also the Son of God, right? 
Emmanuel, God in the flesh. John 1 talked about that. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. What makes Jesus great? Because He was both man and God. Man, so He could die on a cross and shed blood. As God is a spirit, He couldn't shed blood as a spirit. He had to become man so that He could do that for us. But God, so that that blood that He shed was perfect and holy and innocent without sin, so that He could pay the price for my sin, for your sin, on that cross. Does that make Jesus great? Are you thankful that Jesus was God and man and that He did, came to earth to pay the penalty for yours and my sin? Amen, right? We're not an amen church, but say amen for that. Some of you are. Norm's not here this morning. If he was, he would for sure be excited about that. He always picked on me about that amen thing. All right, so number one, what makes Jesus great? He's both God and man. Number two, going back and reading exactly what I just read. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens... Number two, why is he great? Because he has passed through the heavens. That word passed can mean triumphed. Like, it's a triumph. He triumphed through the heavens. And it really, um, and we've been going back to the Old Testament, sometimes by reading it, sometimes by just talking about it. And this is another time where you have to. Hebrews is all about picturing the Old Testament. And so the idea here is passing through. It's talking about a, a high priest who would be in a temple. And he, one time a year, could pass through into the Holy of Holies, pass through the veil. In fact, the veil that was talked about in Matthew, I think it's 2751, where it says when Jesus died, the veil was what? Do you remember? Torn in two from top to bottom. God tore it, right? And it opened up a way so that we can come boldly. And that's, this verse is a lot about that. Come boldly into the Holy of Holies. But it, the picture he's giving here, because all that was happening in the Old Testament and the sacrificial system and, and what he's going to be talking about with Aaron and the Aaronic priesthood, is it was a picture of what was to come. And so the picture was the high priest, once a year, could go into the Holy of Holies and he would put blood on the mercy seat that would atone for the sins of the nation. In fact, it was done on the Day of Atonement. Atonement means paying for. It means it, it was a time where the sins were paid for, even the ones that they didn't even know about that they had committed. We, we do that too, right? Not all sins do we even realize we commit. We commit sins and don't even remember or don't even realize it on the way. And so they, the high priest once a year could pass through. Ephesians uh, 4.10 um, is, is a correlation to this a little bit of what Jesus, when Jesus passed through. More, um, not the picture, but the actual, actual event happening. And maybe we'll start with verse 7. But to each of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also has descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Jesus was the one who descended, right, to earth, became born as a baby, and then ascended. He's the one who passed through the heavens. So that picture in the Old Testament of the high priest once a year passing through to the Holy Holies, Jesus did it. He came to earth, and then he passed through the heavens. In the scripture, they talk about three heavens. First heaven is like the air we breathe right here. The second heaven is where the sun, moon, and stars is. And the third heaven is where? Where God is. It talks about the three heavens. So Jesus passed through the heavens, and not like the picture of being at the mercy seat, which represented the place where God dwells, by the way. That's why they were only allowed to go in there once, and that's why only the high priest could go in there. And it said, 
um, that maybe when the high priest would go in that they would tie a rope to his foot just in case he died because if he went in without, with unconfessed sin, you know, God might take him and nobody could go in and get him so he'd have to drag him out. I've heard many times that that might have been what was happening in the Old Testament. But the point is that they could only do it once a year. But Jesus, when he descended, then he ascended and went back to the throne of God, the dwelling place of God, right? That's the, so he actually fulfilled it in a more permanent way. Does that make sense? He passed. He triumphed through the heavens. Triumphed through the heavens. So what makes Jesus great? He's not just a picture. He is what? The real deal. He, he did the real thing. The picture of the Old Testament, he fulfilled it. In fact, in Galatians, it says that Jesus fulfilled all things. Fulfilled the law, the ceremonial law, even of the Old Testament. So what makes Jesus great? He's both God and man. What makes Jesus great? He passed through the heavens. Not just a picture. The real thing. And then let's look at the next one. He is enthroned. Kind of goes along with the last one a little bit. So it says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. In other words, don't give up on it. We're going to look at that towards the end. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Let us draw fast, draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. We're going to look at an old passage Old Testament passage, Exodus 25, going along, this one goes along with what we were just talking about, the mercy seat, Exodus 25, 17 through 22. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim, which would be angels, shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. In other words, like worship towards God, which is what's going on in heaven if you read Revelation 5. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There, this is key, there I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, and from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you, and commandment for the sons of Israel. The mercy seat represented the place where God dwelt. The place, in fact, the idea of someday when Jesus would sit on the throne himself. This was like a picture of that. And when it says here, in, uh, back in Hebrews, it said that, draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Draw, ne draw near to the mercy seat, is what really you could be saying there. Um, and we talked about how he um, would be, um, a, the high priest would only go in on the Day of Atonement. So, mercy. Does anybody know a definition? How to define mercy? What's that? Okay. It's involved in that. That's grace. Not getting what you do deserve is mercy. It's like the other side of the same coin. But good try. Uh, so, so, mercy is not getting what I do deserve. So mercy has the idea of past sins. Does that make sense? So they would come, remember you said we put the blood on the mercy seat to deal with what? Past sin, right? So when, when you think to come to the throne of mercy is like you come for salvation. To deal with the sin that you've dealt with, right? To deal with the sin that you've done, not dealt with. You're coming to Christ to deal with it. So the idea of coming to the mercy seat, like Titus 3.5. It says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. It's not any good deeds I can do to get saved. It's what Christ already did. And it's me coming before the mercy seat or the mercy of God that I can be saved from my sin. 
Mercy has to do with past sin. Did you know that you can at any time come to Christ for your past sin? Do you know that? And he will forgive you because forgiveness is part of it. God is always willing and ready for a repentant sinner to come to him. Always. There's hope in that, isn't there? That's mercy. That's for somebody who's never accepted him as Savior before. They need the mercy of God, right? We need hell withheld from us, what we do deserve, and heaven given to us, which goes to grace, which we'll look at in a moment here. So, he says here, he, um, in this enthroned, this verse, he says, you may receive mercy. Reminds you of John 1.12, that as many as received him, to them gave you the right to become the children of God. That's salvation. But then what, look, go on, and he says, and find, what? Grace to help in time of need. So it's kind of like that one was salvation, now he's talking about, it looks like sanctification, right? So, um, find grace. Now that's what we need today and in the future, right? So mercy is what we needed for the past, grace is what we need today. We need God's grace to live today. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, do you still need God's grace? Do you still fail? Do sometimes you even want to fail? You don't want to answer that one, do you? Because we still have a sin nature, right? And there's still a propensity, there's still a desire to sin. Because what we say is sinners do what? There we go. Sinners sin. And we are one. We are, but once you accept Christ, you are now a sinner saved by grace. And what you deserved, you don't get. And what you don't deserve, you do get. Mercy and grace. Grace helps us for today. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. That even though I'm failing right now, you still love me. That even though I'm failing right now, I'm still forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you is talking to believers, and it says, if you confess your sin... He is faithful and just to forgive. Do you notice in that verse, it doesn't say, if you failed, ask for forgiveness. It doesn't say that. You've already been forgiven. If you come to the cross for salvation, your forgiveness is complete, past, present, and future. Is that hard to understand? It's hard to understand, and it's hard for us to even wrap our mind around, because don't we have a hard enough time forgiving people for what they've already done, let alone for what they're going to do next? It's tough enough to forgive them for what they've already done. But Jesus at the cross forgave us for all our sin. So the moment that we accept him and say he died on the cross for me, then all my sin is forgiven. So Romans 6 talks about this, by the way. So should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Because how can he who's accepted God's grace want to continue to live in sin. doesn't mean we don't. But when you think of Lot, you say, oh my word, that guy wanted to live in sin. But in Peter, it says that he was vexed. I think that's King James. But he, it was like he was tortured in his soul for the wickedness that was around him. That's why we have to be careful when we look at other people, right? Because we don't know. We, we see their sin, right? It's easy to see that. And we need to come alongside them. We need to love on them. But we should not be condemning. Because you know what? Some people are not concerned about their sin when they're sinning, but some people are tortured inside even though they're continuing to sin. I don't know about you, but I've had certain sins where I've done and done and done, and I keep saying, Lord, please forgive me. And then it's like, okay, I know this is kind of crazy, Lord, but uh, I really mean it, even though I'm saying it again. You ever have times like that? It's the same, same sin, and you're like, here I am, Lord, again. I've done it again. The same thing I asked, said I was sorry for yesterday or this morning or an hour ago, and I'm doing it again. I am so glad that God knows my heart. 
Because sometimes I wonder if I mean it when I think I really do. How about you? And I, if I was evaluating somebody else, I'd for sure say they don't mean it because I would say, if you mean it, you'd stop. That applies to other people but not to ourselves, right? It's easy to think of that when you're looking at somebody else and saying, oh, but, but not me, you know, I'll do it next time, I'll stop. But that's why we need God's grace. Today and every day going forward as long as we're still on this earth. And grace is fulfilled when we get where? Heaven. That's when the fullness of grace appears to us, you could say, is fulfilled, is when we get to heaven. All right, so we looked at four things. What makes Jesus great? So he's both God and man. He passed through the heavens. He sympathizes with us. He's enthroned. This is, now we're going to look at our conclusion. What do we get out of this? Because there's some things going on in between. That he's, ta- that he's com- um, you could say maybe, um, um, not convicting, but challenging them with. There we go. Number one, don't give up on your confession because you're going through testing and trials. Look at this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We say confession. What the heck are they talking about? When we come to Christ, we have to confess that Jesus is Lord, right? Confess our salvation. So the confession he's talking about is our salvation, our our life with Christ. He's saying, hold fast to it. In other words, continue to live it. Because what's going on here, the context, he's talking to the Hebrews, the Jews that have become saved. And he's saying, hold fast to what what you've said. This Jesus is truly the Messiah. Don't go back to the old rituals and the law. Because they were, they were starting to do that. There were people called Judaizers that were going around telling them, yes, you need to believe Jesus is the Messiah, but you still have to be circumcised. You still have to come to the temple. You still have to offer sacrifices. You still have to... And they were starting to go back into the old religious ways. And the problem was, is when they would do that, it would nullify what Christ had done. It made them look like they weren't saved anymore. It made them look like Jesus didn't matter anymore. He wasn't important enough that his sacrifice on the cross was not enough. And so he wasn't meaningful. I, I don't know, but I think that can apply to us, can it? Not that you go back to the Judaic uh, rituals. But what are you going back to? Can't we nullify the confession of our faith by the way that we live? By going back to the old things we used to do before. Remember, uh, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. What's the rest say? I sound like we're all doing a mantra there. It wasn't very clear. <laughs> old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. That doesn't mean we're perfect. But there's a new desire, Right? There's a new standard in my life. There's a new desire to live for Christ that wasn't there before. There's something new in my life. Even in the midst of me failing, I'm not the old man. And so we can do the same thing. The changes that have happened in our life, we can go back to the old things and make it look like Christ doesn't matter. We can stop living for the Lord in a way that the people watching do not see a confession for Christ anymore. Is that true? It is. Oh, well, they just went through a fad. It didn't last. It wasn't real. Because look at the way they are now. Just like they were before. So do we have to be... So that challenge would be to us too, wouldn't it? Let us hold fast our confession. What Christ has done in us and for us, the changes that have happened because of what he's done, hold fast to it. Don't let go. Don't give up. That's what he's saying because of where he's going next. We know that. Like, don't give up because 
Are we tempted sometimes to give up? Is Christian life a battle? Yes or no? Yes. yes. And there's sometimes, is there a temptation to just give up and stop fighting? I want you to know that, yes, it's a battle, but it's a battle worth fighting. And anything that's worth having, what's, it, what's the, the phrase? It's worth fighting for. Let's go into the next, because that leads us into what he says next. Because he says, verse 15, I need a drink of water. He didn't say that in the Bible, but. (laughs) For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. So he goes on to say um, this, because he's he's like, hold your confession, right, of faith. Why? Well, I want to encourage you. Because our high priest exactly knows how you feel. When he came to earth and he was challenged, remember he was 100% man and 100% God. Because he was 100% God, he was not tempted to sin. But because he was 100% man, he had the same draw that we would have. He had the same battle, you could say, in his humanity, so he understands 100% what you're going through when you struggle. Because just in case you think it's a God, I'm a God, he's saying, just in case you think I'm a God who's distant and doesn't care and doesn't understand, and I'm just asking things of you that I have never been through, I need to tell you this. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. No, he never failed, but he understands that we could say the draw to fail because he experienced what we experience without sin. So in other words, don't give up. Your high priest understands your advocate knows. So when you come to him, and because that's the next verse, right? So because of that, let us draw near. Let us draw near to him in confidence. Confidence, in other words, that I know he knows what I'm going through, and I know he cares. He knows the struggles that I'm dealing with today. In fact, this word would mean not just a head knowledge about something, it's an experiential knowledge of it. We know that difference, right? Because it's a difference of salvation sometimes or not. And in this case, he says, it's not just that he knows about what you go through. And that's why, um, and I'm, I'm not trying to read into anything, but that's why I think one of the reasons it was, that was difficult for him in the garden the night before is that he didn't just know about the pain he was going to go through the next day. I think he knew it experientially ahead of time. Does that make any sense to you? Like he would have known exactly the pain that he'd feel. Now we know that probably the most reason he was in tears of blood in the garden is because of the separation with the father he'd have the next day. But I think there was a reality that because he was God, he knew exactly the torture he would go through the next day. He didn't just know about it. And he knows what we go through too. He's not a God who's separate from us. He understands. In fact, that word sympathizes means to suffer with. It's an idea of that he has suffered with us already in the same suffering that we have. Remember, we're not about religion. We're about what? Relationship. Because God is about relationships because he's a personal God. And this is one of the most personal verses that he has in scripture to show us that. To show us that he is not just a distant God for us. He is personally involved and understands exactly what we go through. That should give us hope. So we said don't give up your confession because you're going through testing and trials. And number two, don't go back, go forward. Don't go back, go forward. Therefore, verse 16, let us draw near 
with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of help. Get closer to Jesus. He has help to offer. In fact, when it says to draw near, it really could be translated, let us come. Let us come. Does anybody know of any other times in Scripture where he says something like that? Come. Anybody? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Let's read that one. I actually had that one written down. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Does he say that you won't have burdens? No. But what does he promise? That he will help to lighten the burden in the midst of the burden. He will help to lighten the load in the, in the midst of the carrying. He doesn't say he's going to take all our problems away. He never promised that. In fact, I don't remember what verse it is, but he said, in this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He didn't say, be of good cheer, you will have troubles in this world. He said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And someday, this, the troubles of this world will be gone. That's why, we was mentioned of Dennis earlier, we don't sorrow for him. He doesn't have any more pain. He doesn't have any more suffering. We sorrow because, for us because we miss him. Right? There's a difference. There's a hope. He's, that, that it's going to end. Therefore, come. But you know what? That's the final result. But right now, we can have grace and help in what we're going through today. And I bet if I was to ask, as many of you who could tell me times where you accepted God's help and times where you didn't and what the difference was in your attitude, what the difference was in the weight of it for you. So the conclusion was the two things. Don't give up on your confession because you're going through trials and testings because James is pretty clear we're going to do it, right? But also, don't go back. Go forward. Go towards Christ, not away from Him. James 1 talks all about that. The testings that God gives us are to draw us to Him. Temptation is what Satan tries to encourage us with that pulls us away. We have a choice. We have a choice. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are or want to be our great high priest. Thank you for those of us who have accepted you as Savior, that you are a personal God. You love us. You understand what we go through. You care about it. You, you took our past sins and forgave them. But you didn't then say, okay, see you later. You desire to be with us day after day after day in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our triumphs and everything in between. Thank you for that, Lord, that you're not just a dead God. You're alive and desiring to be involved in our lives today. Lord, I also pray for anyone here who's never accepted you as Savior, who does not have that freedom from the guilt and shame of sin. I pray that today might be the day where they would say, yes, I believe. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he rose again and paid the price for it. And I accept him as my Savior. It's that simple for those of you who don't know. It's just not easy because our humanity, our pride can get in the way. So, Lord, we just thank you for these first few verses that just show the personal aspect of our high priest. And we just pray, Lord, that we would be huh, willing and open to share with you everything in our life, to draw to you instead of drawing away from you, and to hold fast the confession of our faith and not go back to the things of this world. 
In Jesus' name, amen.